I have to find out the matter which will appeal both positions as well as uh, orthopedician. So, again, I think I have choose a common topic, again, which will be helpful for both. And I am going to discuss the topic of femur and embolism, uh, somewhat from orthopedician's perspective. And obviously, uh, physicians would be interested because they are the persons who speak to femur and embolism. So, again, uh, we have very resource limited settings and we don't have uh, city pulmonary and geography and all other required investigations in our. Uh, uh, center. So, uh, how to diagnose the pulmonary embolism and how to stratify the risk and according to risk stratification, how to manage uh, the pulmonary embolism. That I am going to discuss. So, even if you have a limited resource, uh, we can very well diagnose and manage the pulmonary embolism. So, I am not to introduce pulmonary embolism to you all. We have seen the cases very routinely. It is most common preventable cause of death in hospitalized patients, causing near about 6 lakh deaths per year. 80% of the pulmonary embolia occur without prior warning signs. And two thirds of the death due to pulmonary embolia occur within first 30 minutes of death. Death due to massive is often immediate. Diagnosis at times can be difficult. But early treatment is highly effective and highly rewarding. Pathology, almost 90% of the Angola originated from the major leg veins. So this was just an introduction. So what are the common dilemmas uh, when we actually see a patient, so P or suspected P rather I would say. It's like when we suspect P, the first thing is which investigation we should do, the next investigation. Whether we should admit the patient or not, what is the risk of recurrence? Since we patient have pulmonary the second episode of pulmonary embolism, what is the mortality risk? Is it high in all pulmonary embolism? Obviously, we need to tell the relatives to the patient that how much risk he is having, whether he is high risk or not, whether he needs admission or not. And all these questions I will try to answer in my lecture. So our goal is to prevent the drain from the current embolic event, reduce the likelihood of the second embolic event or the current embolic event and minimize the long term morbidity from the event which has already occurred. So this coming to the scenario, I will take this one case to discuss my way forward. This is a 70 year old male which is a known case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. had a fall and a leg fever neck fracture three days back. And now we developed sudden onset breathlessness with chest pain, which was sort of pluridic type. His heart rate is 94, his blood pressure is 98 systolic, his saturation is 95. There are no evident signs of deep blood thrombosis. His respiratory system is sort of clear, loud, second heart sound you can hear, and ECG showing right axis deviation. So now what? So what is the next investigation of choice in this patient? I would like to have interaction from your side, so then only I can be Any take on which <coughs> investigation you will prefer in such scenario? <coughs> yes? Why do you know? I think answer is right, but we'll see. Uh, I will first discuss few things about the pulmonary embolism. Our aim is to quick diagnosis, either we have to confirm the P or we have to rule out the P. If it is P, whether it needs thrombolysis or not, and whether it needs CT to confirm the embolism or not, these things we need to answer. So if we suspect the P on clinical findings, then before diagnosis you have to stratify the risk and that is important in disease. When you stratify the risk, you judge the risk even before the complete diagnosis of pulmonary embolism because your management changes accordingly, your plan to investigation changes accordingly. So you have to decide whether the patient is high risk or intermediate risk or low risk. Then you can apply so many. There are, if you have resource limited setting, there are so many good score systems. If we apply that, you can easily detect the risk of the patient, you can manage the patient accordingly. 
For example, whale score, if you would be aware of the whales and Geneva scores of permanent embolism, then there are list of investigation and treatment. So clinical presentation, most common symptom is breathlessness. Is then chest pain. Syncup is a rare presentation, but it indicates that E is massive and severe. And symptom can develop over weeks in some patient and over minutes in some patients. So it, it's not like uh, it can be in minutes, it can be slowly in weeks. If patient with pre-existing heart failure or COPD, worsening or dyspnea may indicate permanent increase. So if we see this scientific statement from American Heart Association, it divides E into three stages, massive, submassive and low risk P. Massive means P with cardiogenic shock is a massive P. P with hypotension. Hypotension means blood pressure, systolic blood pressure raised than 90 for at least 15 minutes, it is not transient and it is not due to any other identifiable cause or patient requiring anatomy to maintain the blood pressure, it comes under massive P. Submassive P means patient is not having hypertension but he is having at least one of the two, RV dilatation or my markers of the myocardial necrosis are increased. And you, so RV dilatation, may be on eco, it may be on CT or it may be in the form of biomarker like increased BMP or myocardial necrosis in form of increased troponin. No risk P is, patient is having P but having none of this. If there are no signs of RV dilatation or there are no signs of hypotension or anything, that is low risk P. So this is what just we discuss. Again, intermediate risk is again divided into two. Intermediate high, intermediate low. We'll come to that. <coughs> so this is the well score. It is very simplified well score. It is very easy to use. Only few things you have to see. It has given one point to each, like previous PE or DVD, heart rate more than 100, surgery or immobilization less than 30, hemoptysis, active malignancy, signs of DVD, alternate diagnosis less likely, and if all these things, if the score is less than or equal to 1, then PE is unlikely. If it is more than 1, then PE is likely. So, and there is another score which is known as PERC, means PE rule out criteria. So these are the criteria like age, pulse oximetry, heart rate, prior venous thromboembolism, hemoptysis, <coughs> oxygen use, unilateral leg swelling. If none of this is there, you can safely rule out PE. The study says that if all the criteria are met, the possibility of PE is less than 2%. So if a patient met all these criteria, and clinical prediction core also suggests that P is unlikely, then you need not to investigate that patient. ECG, you will see right axis deviation, RBBB, anterocephal ST deviation in something and in some patients, eco RARV dilatation and increased PA pressure. Enzymes, D dimer would be raised, you see massive P generally it is more than 4000. Probian would be more than 900, troponins would be on higher sides. This is typical S1, Q3, T3 pattern. You can see there is S wave, T wave inversion is not Q wave in V3 and T inversion in V1 to V3. This is known as typical pattern of the coronary embolism. And this is the buccalar signs typically found on eco There is RV dysfunction, RV is dilated. But you see the apex of RV which is hyperperfected. This is known as mercury science. This is a screening ultrasound what they call simple four point screening ultrasound you can do in suspected DVD uh, patient, two drawings and two completely unfortunate. It has low sensitivity but very high specificity so if you detect DVD. It is fast because you need to go ahead with the management very fast, that's why they discovered that. CTPA, obviously, CT pulmonary angiography nowadays considered a first investigation rather than available. Pulmonary angiography, traditional pulmonary angiography is considered a gold standard, but we are not doing routinely nowadays. Very rarely employed. EQ scan, it is nowadays considered outdated. 
Uh, it is used in very few indications of the use case out there. We really, really cannot go ahead with the security. We really need to confirm the developers whether we can do the use case. Again, but the use case will give you the probability. It's low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability. In that any way you can judge from the clinical scores. So practically, that is not much helpful. This is the CT showing progress in the segmental arteries. Again, you can see RARB dilatation on the CT. And this is pulmonary angiography demonstrating progress in the RPE. So, initial risk stratification is very easy. Whether patient has shock, he is high risk, not, then at least he is not high risk, not having CT. Then if he is having shock, the treatment is different. If he is not having shock, investigation and the treatment is different. So, suspected P with shock or a hypotension. Then CTPA or CT pulmonary angiography in such scenario, if it is available immediately in the same center, then go ahead with the CTPA, confirm P and thrombolyze the patient. If CTPA is not available, then the second investigation of choice in such scenario is echocardiography because you will always have echo finding when patient is in having massive P and shock. You will find RIV dilatation, severe pH. So if you find all these presumptive things on echo, consider it as a P and treat the patient accordingly. So this is in the patient who is having shock. Now the patient who is not in a shock, means either he is intermediate or a low risk, then what to do? Then again, you have to assess whether he is likely or not, whether he is the patient is high risk or P. If he is a high risk or P, then directly go for CTPA. If he is not, then pre -diamer. So, we generally do pre when the patient we suspect P. When there is a high probability of P, T dimer is not an investigation of choice. It's generally, CTP is the investigation of choice. When the P is less likely, then we go for D dimer because D dimer will not confirm the P, it will only rule out the P. So, positive D dimer doesn't confirm the pulmonary embolism, but negative D dimer will definitely rule out the pulmonary embolism. So, if D dimer is positive, then you have to again go ahead with the CT angiography confirm whether there is pulmonary embolism and then treat it. So, back to our patient. So, now, say the patient COPD, fracture fever, is having 98 systolic blood pressure and saturation of 95. So, what is the first thing? Any take? I just discuss use the clinical prediction rule. So you have to in any patients we have to see whether P is likely or not. Now if you see this scenario, it seems that P is likely, but we will see what the clinical score says. There is no previous history, heart rate is less than 100. Yes, he is having immobilization per se, not longer, but he is having fractured tumor. So one point for that, hemoptysis was not there, there was no malignancy. No signs of DVT. Alternative diagnosis less than only he is having COPD. So, breathlessness, alternative diagnosis may be likely. So, waste criteria is 1. So, 1 or less than or equal to 1 is E less likely. Right? So, our clinical criteria says E less likely. So, then what? What is the next investigation of choice in this patient? Then? If he is less likely, investigation of choice is D diamond. When he is less likely, investigation of choice is D diamond. So, what if patient is not affording for D diamond or D diamond is not available? So again, I discussed this, but I have not mentioned all these things there. But this was the criteria I already discussed: is pulmonary embolism ruled out criteria. So you go ahead with this, check all the. If all parameters are met, you need not to do DDM. 
P less likely and if P rule out criteria is satisfied, you need not to investigate the patient because the possibility of P is less than 2%. So patient is stable, clinical condition is stable and score says P is less likely and P rule out criteria also says P is not there. So then you may you can treat this patient or the PD also may not be investigated. Right? So we'll apply this criteria to our patient. What what would it be? So age is more than 50, is pulse oxygen. He has recent history of trauma. So two points are already there. So we cannot rule out. To rule out, all criteria should be made. Even one criteria is there, you cannot rule out P in this. So two criteria are not meeting, so we cannot rule out the P. So P is not completely ruled out. So P is less likely, but it is not ruled out. So our aim was either to confirm the P or to rule out the P. Right? So again, the criteria was not meeting. Anyway, we did need to happen and it was raised. So now what next? When D dimer is raised, if it is not raised, then it has good work. If it is raised, then CTPA. So CTPA was suggested by lateral segmental artery thromboembolism. So then what next? <laughs> so now you have confirmed that there is a P. So now you have to decide the treatment. And again, treatment depends on the risk. So this patient is not a high risk, but patient may have intermediate high risk, intermediate low risk or low risk. If patient is having intermediate risk, patient needs animation. If patient is low risk, patient can be treated on opioid basis. So again, risk stratification here we can, and the same thing. Redirect and you can do BNP and troponin. Again, when you do biomarker in each and every patient of the P. It's not possible always to do all these things. So then, if if you really want to stratify the risk further and tell there is one more score is known as PE severity index. It is also simple index. If the score is zero, that patient is low risk. You may not you do not do any other biomarkers. Treat it the patient as a low risk. But if the score is one or more than one, then you need to investigate or at least treat that patient as an intermediate risk patient. So when this severity index is more than one and either of the RV dysfunction or one biomarker is positive, if both are positive then it is intermediate high risk and such patient needs close observation, they may have recurrent event and may be converted into a massive PE. Those patients are intermediate low risk, that patient can be treated safely with anticoagulation but they need hospitalization. So this index in our patient was 1. His biomarker study of anti-proteinity was 700 and troponin was negative. So it falls under intermediate low risk category for P mortality. And patient was given anticoagulation and discharged after stabilization. So now a few slides about the treatment, prevention of DVT and P. The traditional treatment for DVT and coronary embolism after thrombolysis is you can say uh, intravenous anticoagulation or uh, injectable anticoagulation followed by oral anticoagulation. Traditionally we follow heparin with warfarin. That is the traditional treatment. But we all know we all have used warfarin and we all know the drawbacks and side effects and the therapeutic challenges while using the warfarin. So there are so many limitations, it's unpredictable response, very narrow therapeutic window, you have to maintain INR between 2 to 3. Coagulation monitoring is not always possible, it is slow onset, once you increase the dose you need to wait for 3-4 days to achieve, uh, to see that what effect you have achieved. Intracranial bleeding risk is higher, frequent dose adjustment, frequent checking, the numerous drug interaction, food interaction, all these are the side effects. So we were in need of some new agents and now fortunately we have new agents 
available in this. What is the other one? There are they are also called as Novax, Novel, Oral, Multicoagulants. These are Dabigatron, Neuraxabad, and Apixabad. Physicians and orthopedicians are very well aware of all these molecules. And if you use Dabigatron, you have to use Hyperin for 5 days and then shift to Dabigatron. The dose is for 50 mg DID. Reorexabend, you can direct start as an oral therapy, 15 mg DID for first 21 days and then shift to 20 mg only. So, these are the few practice. And DVD prophylaxis, prophylaxis doses are different than the treatment doses. You can use enoxaparin and fondaparinox in a prophylaxis. There are difference of opinion in Europeans and Americans about the dose of enoxaparin. In America, they use uh, 0.3 mg DID. In Europe, they use 0.4 mg OD for prevention of DVD. Fondaparinol's dose is same. But agents like Dabigatron and Neuroxabal, they are approved for a DVD prophylaxis in post-surgical patients. Doses are like 150 mg daily and 10 mg daily. And prophylaxis, I think you are aware of, is recommended for at least 20 days after DKR and 30 to 35 days after DHR. Thank you.